Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Awards Watch Oscar podcast. I'm your host, Eric Anderson. This is podcast number 56, and it is, what is today, Wednesday, August 10th? Something? Ninth. Ninth? Yes, yes, ninth. There we go. Uh, and today I have with me Gold Rush Gang member Brian Bonifed. Hello, Brian. Hey, Eric. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. It's just a us duo today, and... We have a, a lot to talk about. A lot has happened. We have uh, full lineups, well, potentially full lineups of the major fall festivals, save Telluride, since they do things a little differently. Uh, New York just announced yesterday. And while there were some obvious things on there that most of us were able to predict, there were a couple of things missing that were a bit of a surprise. And... I would say the biggest surprise from that list was Alexander Payne's downsizing, not making the cut, at least in the initial main slate. Um, he's been very popular with them, and I, I, I think any of us that follow this even just a little bit would have expected to have seen that. And I, th I think you would agree, Brian, that was a pretty big surprise. Yeah, uh, just his profile at New York. Um, but again, like you said, uh, it's only their initial announcement. Um, the other film that's at the three festival, Shape of Water, also didn't show up. So mm -hmm. we don't really know yet if either of those is actually going to screen at New York. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, and we do see every year, you know, other things get added and they're in just, you know, different places or they'll have a single showing. And and. I think sometimes maybe we read a little more into that than is necessary, but you know, you build you build a brand and you build a narrative through your festival runs as you march toward, you know, the the Dolby. So that's just kind of what you do. Yeah, I um I don't I don't know if, like if it's a big indication on like that film because we can get into that film in a little bit but um, it, I, it I get the sense that New York really doesn't like like they're competing against Venice at this point and they really don't <clears throat> like giving uh, things that premiere at Venice like a good spot at their festival now um, I know they were really interested in one film that is not in the initial lineup and I think it's because it's premiering at Venice so um, I, I don't really, I don't take it right as a huge sign right now that, um, downsizing or shape of water is not there. So, but it, it could, they could still end up playing. We don't know, but they really just want to do their own thing and they want to separate themselves from Venice. And I don't think that they want to give, like they didn't even, I think they rejected La La Land last year. So, mm -hmm. and because they, because they couldn't get it. Yeah. So it's a premiere. So they are, kind <coughs> of in their own, they're kind of in their own, like, they have their own goals, basically, and it's not necessarily just about the quality of the film. Yeah, and they're they're also a little bit uh, later, mm -hmm. so it's it's by the by the time uh, a lot of these festivals have already announced, you know, the they've they've gobbled up a good a good portion of the of the heavy hitters and the big titles, and as we have seen. Uh, increasingly so year to year these festivals have become very uh petty <laughs> and bitter very, very petty with yeah. each other and and what they will allow and it's pretty frustrating because it then becomes completely not for the benefit of of the film goer but just for the bragging rights uh and dick measuring that they do with each other every single year. It's mm -hmm. it's kind of frustrating. Yeah. I mean, if if you if you are really going to set, <clears throat> you know, you can't show here if you premiere here first kind of things. It's you know, why 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 even do that? So yeah, I mean, it's just a power play, really. I had heard like for take example for Wonder Wheel, which is closing New York. I had heard that might have gone to Venice. But then New York offered the closer spot, and that's kind of what got it. So that's kind of the game they play with some of these movies. Um, you know, New York only has so many showcase spots, and 
they try to get the best films they can for those spots. And if it's a premiere at Venice or going to Telluride or something, they're not nearly as interested, even if the film's the same quality. It doesn't change. It's just mm -hmm. power, basically. It is. Uh, there, there's also, even though it was announced before, you know, the official main slate, it's really fascinating that the entire lineup of opening centerpiece and closing night in New York are all Amazon films. Yeah, it's basically the Amazon Film Festival. They got the um, opener, centerpiece, and uh, closer, which is amazing. Um, but, you know, when Amazon's being this auteur-friendly and they're giving, you know, Woody Allen and, and Todd Haynes and Richard Linklater blank checks and just saying, you know, make movies for us, those are all, you know, festival favorites, especially the New York Festival that cares a lot about that particular film festival, the curators, they care a lot about, like, just directorial uh, prestige and body of work and stuff like that. And so that's, they're going to support, you know, the streaming services because those are the ones giving these auteur directors, um, the opportunity to make projects they want to make. So it's not it's, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, and Netflix did, uh, okay here as well. Mudbound and the Myrowitz stories are, um, are in the lineup. And I think Mudbound really needed to show yeah. up here. Yeah. Um, definitely. I, I know within at least our predictions, we've been back and forth on the movie and and its stars and director. And justifiably so, because Netflix has not been able to to break that uh, that barrier between itself and and the academy. And they have a very different release strategy than uh, Amazon does. Amazon, has f followed the the rules and laws uh, of the movie industry to a, a point where they are able to get nominations and wins. They did really well with Manchester by the Sea um, because they they join with a traditional distributor. They have a uh, a theatrical window before it debuts to the streaming service, and that's what. The movie industry wants they don't want this day and date stuff it it's it doesn't work for them they're not they're not ready to, to make that jump so unless <clears throat> and we'll keep saying this until it happens unless uh unless netflix does the same thing i don't see how they're going to be able to mount a realistic campaign for something like like mudbound yeah, I um, I'm kind of taking a wait and see approach on this. It's it's basically since Sundance and it was acquired it by Netflix at Sundance. I've always had it kind of on the periphery of my uh, predictions because I just like you said, I don't. We have from what we've seen so far, actions speak louder than words. Netflix doesn't uh, do they do the date and date thing. So um, until that changes, I'm going to be you know pessimistic. But let's like I said, let's wait and see. It's only August. It's early August. We're three months away from like campaigns really revving up. And I'll just say that I don't think that Netflix hired, they hired both Cynthia, Cynthia Schwartz and Lisa Tabe for this yeah. film. Yeah. They didn't do that just to let it die during award season. Like it's going to be in the conversation. E even if it's day and date, it's going to make, it's going to make a play at SAG. It's going to, it's going to be in the conversation. It's got a, you know, it's got good reviews. I think it's like 82 on Metacritic could go up. Uh, after the fall festivals um, it's a powerful film it has a diverse cast which is there aren't that many of those this year mm -hmm. so um, it's got a path I think it's squarely in the conversation for best picture and you know the supporting categories and adapted screenplay that's a weak category so they can make it in there so mm -hmm. I'm, I would not write off this film just yet let's see maybe Netflix makes a change maybe they put it in LA and New York for like a week before putting it on Netflix that maybe that helps I don't know yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to uh, count it out. I just, uh, I, I just think they do, they, they need to do something. And you're absolutely right that you do not hire those two women if you no. are, if you are not absolutely serious about a campaign. And you know that, I mean, that alone should, should keep it in, in the conversation. So, yep, it's. <laughs> It's it's interesting too. You you list that that was a, a Sundance film. There are, I feel like more Sundance films um, holding on to a good amount and of of buzz throughout the year, 
even even than than normal. Uh, Call me by your name, which also showed up uh, on New York Slate, uh, is from Sundance. Um, Novitiate is not on here, but that's another Sony Classic Sundance pick. Um, that I feel takes a lot of. Um, I I don't know what the, what the, what the word I'm looking for is, but it's it it takes a lot I think for a film to debut in January and be able to hold on to uh, buzz and stay in the conversation for the entire year, because so much of what we see is the the race shapes itself in September October from the these festivals less so than than Sundance, but I'm I'm glad to see that. Well, I mean, and, and not just, um, you know, Call Me By Your Name, Mudbound, Novitiate, like you said. I'd, I'd, I'd throw in Get Out, which world premiered at Sundance, and The Big Sick, which was a Sundance film. I mean, you have five, in my estimation, you have five films that in one way or another, I think are going to make an imprint on the Oscar race that came out of Sundance, which is kind of, I mean, in all the years I've been following it, that's a that's a banner year for Sundance in terms of potential awards players. I mean, I'm looking at call your call me by your name and get out i think they're going to make best picture i think mudbound and even the big sick and we can get into that film later i don't really understand why people are dropping it all of a sudden <laughs> um it has a really strong profile uh those are both very much in the mix for best picture and then you have novitiate which is this small little uh film that really got overlooked at the festival but when you have a performance like melissa leo's behind it which is going to get a ton of buzz and a lot of new people and new reviews at, at, at Toronto and all this or, or wherever it, it plays, that's going to, you know, that might not be a best picture player, but it's going to make waves for sure. So, yeah, I think this was a banner year for Sundance. Yeah. And, and I think we've had Melissa Leo as the, the number one front runner in supporting actress since the, the predictions began like in March. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. So she's, she has never left that, that spot. <clears throat> and it's got a really good October release date, and it's it's going to do extremely well. In fact, I think Sony Pictures has a really, really big slate this year. Um, they have a lot to juggle. They have a lot to prioritize. Um, and although Call Me By Your Name is pretty clearly their, their number one, and it has the, the, the broadest potential... Uh, they're really covering their bases in a way that I always find very intelligent for uh, smaller studios and and, and the, the indie studios where they have a really nice slate of films that kind of all hit different places and and this is no exception the, they've got you know lead actor and supporting actor and supporting actress covered and now now they have best actress covered. they have best actress cover because one of the the other things that happened uh this last week was the rumor that that sony pictures was going to buy annette benning's uh hopeful actress race movie uh film stars don't die in liverpool uh happened and that I, I mean I'm, I'm super excited for it I'm really really I, I'm really hopeful um, I am glad that I put Benning as my number one before it happened <laughs> <laughs> but I mean she was she was in the conversation before uh, Sony Pictures was but it was just uh, we, we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know if it was going to get picked up. Uh, I know there is zero faith in the director. <laughs> <laughs> Which that's is... Putting it lightly. Yes. I mean, that's, and, and that's 100% accurate. The director has a pretty ugly track record of, of really bad films. But something that is kind of striking is that this little quiet romance biopic is completely left field for the types of movies that he's done. 
So I, I, I feel like that might be the key uh, as to, to why this might work out. Um, you know, and it's it's very likely this will just play out very similarly to uh, Julianne Moore's win for Still Alice, also from Sony Pictures Classics. And, you know, it might be just a play for Benning and, and that's it. Um, but, you know, like you said before, adapted screenplay is a is kind of open this year as opposed to original and it, it could sneak in there but we kind of tried to do that with still Alice too and that that did not work out <laughs> so i i don't know we'll see um i'm go ahead you're all, in, you're all in on benning oh i'm 100 percent on benning i am i i am 100 percent. i am not going to consider anybody else <laughs> Film nope. stars, film stars don't die in Liverpool is filled with outstanding performances. It you just is. tell Sony Pictures classics right now. Uh, <laughs> it is. I'd love for Jamie Bell to get, to get something. That would be pretty cool. Um, but no, I'm I am all in. I'm all in. So okay, I will play devil's advocate here because I know you're good. You've got at Benning at number one. Um, and I I totally respect that opinion that this is going to be Julianne Moore all over again. I think. The art, it's a really good sign, first of all, that we should uh, clarify that it's going to Telluride because it on the TIFF uh, thing, it said it's Canadian via Telluride, which is a good sign. Um, also a big deal because, you know, the whole thing with Benning is this this narrative she's going to have that she's never won before. And, and I, it's very obvious that that's what Sony Pictures Classics is going to push. You want her to get out in front of the race. You know, when you have these heavy hitters like Meryl Streep and Kate Winslet and some of these big names in the race, they're not premiering until, you know, Winslet at New York. Streep's film's going to be really late. So if Benning can establish herself as the front runner from Telluride, which we saw with uh, Brie Larson and Emma Stone the last two years, mm -hmm. um, that's a big deal. Like that really, especially if she's the one that, uh, you know, you want those Oscar voters, those AMP members leaving Telluride going, this is Annette Benning's year. We got to tell everyone, you know, vote for Annette Benning this year because, this is the one she's supposed to win for. And it's obviously a very baity role. Uh, former Oscar winner, has stomach cancer, um, and it's a love story. Um, I just, it's a, it's a great role on paper. So despite all the reservations about the director and the actual quality of the film, you can see the, the ingredients for, a, for a, that kind of Julianne Moore thing all over again. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, don't, I don't have any problem with the prediction. I'll just say that I'm looking at this category and I see Meryl, I see a lot of competition. I see Meryl Streep in a Spielberg film that's very timely politi politically. Um, is this the strongest project she's ever had on paper? Like, I can't even remember another, you know, usually her films are like showcases for her, yeah. but we always have questions about the quality of the overall film's profile. We all have it as a top five best picture film. Like we expect it to be a huge Oscar player. And Streep is usually never in movies like that. So we really, and she's playing, you know, uh, Catherine Graham, a real person. She does very well playing real people. Um, it's a really, she has a really good setup. Um, Kate Winslet in a Woody Allen showcase role. Not, not much more needs to be said. She's going to probably be a player for that. Yeah. Um, Frances McDormand in a monster role, backed by Fox Searchlight. And if anyone's seen the trailer, it's not hard to see that she's probably the favorite for the Comedy Globe. I mean, she's on one in that trailer she's that that performance is gonna be a big deal it could be a play for critics awards mm -hmm. um and she's so she's in a really good spot sally i would i would throw in sally hawkins because i'm really high on on shape of water but she has a she's the protagonist she has a very uh, she plays a mute woman it's baity it's emotional uh, it's a very sympathetic character i can't stress enough that it's a very audience friendly character um, and if that's a very strong best picture film, she's absolutely going to be in the race. And that's not even mentioning Judy Dench playing Queen Victoria, Claire <laughs> Foy in a in a dollar store theory of everything, where <laughs> where she has gotten, from what I've heard, she's the standout of that movie. So yes, um, and I'll just throw in Sir Sharon to piss you off. So um, uh, that's well, a lot of that's a lot of names of of people that can not only get nominated but can I think have a have a case to win you know there's a lot of i could see a lot of those women end up 
have a path to winning. So I don't think it's going to be the year that Julianne Moore had where your runner up was like the classic supporting wife role that could have easily been frauding into supporting. That's that's not this year. It's going to be much stronger. And I just don't like seeing all these definitive statements like, oh, this is definitely Street versus Winslet or this is, you know, mm. Benning's definitely has it locked up. Like, I just I don't agree with any of that. <clears throat> So. It and I, it's that's a that's a great breakdown of, of of what we have. I mean, you can you could also probably add Jennifer Lawrence and Mother. That trailer just debuted mm-hmm. this week too. But I I feel like it might be just a a bit too out there. It was that trailer is insane. I yeah I, I really I mean I don't think she's gonna win for that. I no no no. But I mean just I can understand if you think she's gonna get nominated, but. For me personally, it's going to take like a combination of like critics wins and she's going to actually have to care. Like, I don't know if she cares about awards to campaign enough anymore. So I don't I I just I don't know if the calibration is right for that type of movie. But I understand why people think she'll be she'll be a player for it. Yeah. But I mean, it's let's looking at at uh, our current top five. Everybody on that list is uh, a, a lead actress winner. Or supporting mm-hmm. actress winner, except for Benning. It's also a, a a much older skewing list than than this category normally has. Yes, which, yes. which both, I think benefits both, both, Claire Foy. I was about to say both of those things you just said. Uh, a bunch of former winners or former nominees and an older skewing group. I mean, that's why Claire Foy made so much sense to me. Mm-hmm. And I still have her sixth, and I still think that she's absolutely going to be in the mix uh, for a nomination. She also seems like the type who will, like, move to L.A. and, like, campaign her ass off the whole entire season if she's close. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and it kind of reminds me of Ruth Nega last year a little bit. So, I don't, um, I yeah, I'm not writing her off at all. I think she's going to be in the mix for sure. No, she's she's still in my top five. I would be really hard pressed to take her out, um, because of that. She is she has Anjanu's status. Um, she has the crown, which you know, if she wins at the Emmys or the show is successful enough, you know, that's that keeps her in the conversation. Um, doesn't she have the the Neil Armstrong movie next year? Yeah, yeah but that's not that's not going to be. Uh, we're not going to get anything about that this year. But no, yeah. no, no. But in terms of of like where she'll be if 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 they're shooting, you know, in the right, states yeah, and I in think, California. I think Damien is shooting a lot of that in L.A. So so she'll be there. So she can she can red carpet it up. There you go. And 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 party it up. Um, you did mention mention uh, Saoirse Ronan. I'm I'm not going to shade her at all because <laughs> that is that is a movie uh, that showed up in uh, New York Film Festival slate as well. Um, that movie's profile is really 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 blowing up and very quickly. Um, and that's a twenty four. That is mm-hmm. Greta Gerwig's directorial debut. I mean, I'm not saying that it's positioning itself, you know, in picture and director, really. But, I mean, director has has very little in the realm of uh, female representation this year, um, as with almost any year. So I, I, th- I think there's, they'll, they'll at least be, you know, a, a considerable push to get to get her there. But I, I, I can see that movie doing, doing really well and, and Ronan, uh, benefiting as a result. Um, since we're still on best actress, because why not? Um, Magnolia, uh, pictures just bought, uh, in the fade, the Diane Kruger, uh, terrorist, uh, revenge movie uh that she won best actress for at Cannes this year by default but whatever <laughs> <laughs> um i don't think she's really you know any she's not going to make really much of an impact here especially with magnolia being behind it they're just you know it's magnolia not re- is not good yeah mm. the film has a 60 on metacritic so um, exactly 
No, I don't think I don't think she's gonna be in the mix. I uh, just to go back to Ronan for a second. That film showed up at tell is going to be a Telluride, mm-hmm. Toronto and New York. Mm-hmm. That's a great festival run. I will say it is Scott Rudin, so it's showing up at <laughs> Telluride and New York is not surprising. Um, a24 picking it up was a great sign, giving it a no- November 10th release. That's a great release date, much better than what 20th Century Women was stuck with last year. Oh my God, um, yeah. And, you know, we think Florida Project is kind of their default number one, but that is not showing up at apparently, according to the New York, uh, New York said it's a U.S. premiere, mm-hmm. which means not at Telluride or Toronto. I mean, that would be a blow. <laughs> that would be a blow for that film. I'm just going to put that out there. And Lady Bird could end up being more accessible. I'm a little, I'm always a little cautious about, okay, this is a female directorial debut about a female coming into coming of age story. I mean, those two things together never end up being a best picture nomination. Yes. Uh, so I'm a little cautious on that, but I, I do think it'll be, a, I am very confident in the quality of the film. And I think Ronan and Laurie Metcalf, who uh, apparently is the supporting actress play in the movie. Um, you know, I think both of those, those performances could pop and supporting actress is a pretty weak open category still. So um, I think that both of them could be in the mix for sure. Um, and I do think it'll get good reviews. Um, so I do have my on that one. I just don't know. Like if that's a 24s number one, if a female directorial debut uh, about a coming of age you know, female story is their number one. They might not make best picture this year. That's all I'm saying. Well, you know, they they just won with a black gay male coming of age. Oh, story. I know. So I, 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 you know, a twenty four at all. I'm just saying that that's that's not a good combination. And I love I love I mean I'm I'm I have a lot of confidence in Gerwig, and I think the film will be good. It's just very pessimistic about that combination of things uh with a very male dominated academy still yeah no it's those those are all those are all really good arguments and and you're right supporting actress as a category is kind of really open right now um outside of melissa leo who like we said before has been number one this entire year and she has all number one votes from all of us right now um we've got uh, Michelle Pfeiffer really kind of popped, uh, and she is at number two for Mother, Holly Hunter, uh, for The Big Sick, and Octavia, Octavia Spencer, Shape of Water, and then, I mean, what would be a newcomer nominee, uh, Vicki Cripps for Phantom Thread, or whatever, the PTA fashion drama Fifty Shades of Grey. The Art House Fifty Shades of Grey. Of is of going to be... Um, and Lori Metcalf, like, like you mentioned, uh, if I, Tanya comes out this year, uh, Allison Janney is very much in the mix. Um, that movie's only playing Toronto, right? That's yeah. Toronto only not the best sign. Not but... really. Not really. So it's Janney's like at number nine right now and I don't have her in and I didn't really want to put her or Margot Robbie in until we had some official you know, 2017 release date. So yeah, and it doesn't even have a because Miramax partners with a distributor. It doesn't have a distributor yet. Nope. So um, yeah, still we that that mo- that whole entire film is too much of a question mark right now. But yeah, I feel like it's going to be held, and it won't debut this year. But I don't know. We'll see. It's yeah. It's just the the only playing Toronto thing. It gives me some pause. Um. There's. What else? There's a, there's a lot in this category. Um, if if um, Kate Winslet is a really 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 strong contender, then uh, Juno Temple could come along as the Sally Hawkins to <laughs> to Winslet's Kate Blanchett. Mm-hmm. Um, hmm. Hong Chow downsizing. I know she's yeah. making a little bit of a comeback, even though the film is is kind of in in the the the, the questionable stage we, we yep. talked a little bit about that at the beginning um but it might be worth kind of diving into a little bit and uh downsizing is a pretty big gamble for paramount uh and a, and a big change for pain in terms of 
budget and style. It's a $70 million sort of sci-fi-ish satire fantasy. Um, it, it ran through quite a few test screenings. I think it went up to like six or seven. Uh, about seven, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and public, public, screen. public screenings. I had some private screenings. Too, yes. Yeah. Public screenings. Um, and you know, I, 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 I say each year now after the debacle of joy, uh, that it's, it's hard to, to really judge a movie based on, in, on its test screenings. And I think it's not really the best way to plan your, uh, awards predicting, but the, the feedback was, was not, was not great for the most part. Um, and a lot of it centered actually around Hong Chao's character, which you know, I heard so many competing uh, comments. One, you know, that she has the best role and she has a great arc and great scenes. And then the other was that her overdone and over-the-top accent could be perceived as really racist. So I, it's it's tough. I still don't know really where to to land with the film and it's going to take you know, reviews, real reviews, uh, to be able to, to make some, some decisions on it, I think. Yeah. This is a fascinating film to me because, um, if we just looked at it from the perspective of this is an Alexander Payne film, uh, with a great cast, uh, that he basically called his, you know, what he wanted to be his masterpiece or, or something he's been working on for a long time. That's opening Venice that's playing at the the trio of fall festivals, Venice, Telluride, and Toronto. The only other film that's doing that is Shape of Water. And the precedent of films that play all three is very strong in terms of eventual awards players. Yes. Um, if you just took that profile, and I think you would just assume this is a sure thing. Like, And I think a lot of people are. Even that, even Alberto Barbara, the Venice, uh, the guy, uh, Venice curator said, you know, obviously when asked what's, what his Oscar players are, he said, obviously downsizing because it's pain, you know, <laughs> um, it, it almost sounded like obligatory to me. Um, not necessarily that he loved the film, but that duh, it's a pain film. So it's going to be an Oscar film. Mm -hmm. um, I am very hesitant from what I've heard about the movie. It sounds polarizing. It sounds like the type of thing that will get mixed reviews that even if it gets a lot of positive reviews, there will be reviews in the red on Metacritic. So it's like, I don't know what the critical consensus is going to be like. Um, if it gets, I would say if it gets just decent, all it needs is like decent reviews and just avoid getting panned. And I think Hong Chao will, I would feel pretty confident saying she'll be in the mix because she has the best role in the film. It's very loud and showy. Um, it's dominant. Once she enters, she owns the movie, from what I've heard. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, you know, and we're always also, we're looking for um, uh, actors that can get nominated, actors of diversity, and there just aren't that many this year. You know, you have Denzel Washington, maybe Lawrence Fishburne, uh, the Mudbound actors, um, but there really aren't that many places to look for um, people of diversity to get nominated. So um, I think... I think Hong Chao is in a really good spot as long as the film just survives. And to be honest, I think Paramount, you know, Payne's had a past of of having kind of mixed results in test screenings. And look at his track record. I mean, I think mm -hmm. they have a lot of confidence that no matter what all the, you know, it look, the, a film never tests seven times if the results are that good. Like, that just <laughs> means that they can't figure out, probably can't figure out why a lot of people don't like it. But... Um, he in the past he's he's you know he's really good in post and he's had a history of fixing things and I think they've poured so much into this movie not just financially but you know they have a very strong relationship with Payne he has a lot of pull with Paramount uh, Giannopoulos his buddy is running the show there now they were never going to drop this film I don't like even if even with the bad you know buzz around it they were always going to put everything they could into making this film their awards play. And it clearly is. I mean, you look at the release date, 
the limited release, the festival rollout. They're trying to make this film happen. Um, so we'll see. I'm, I'm very fascinated to see how it lands at Venice and what the reaction is like. But like I said, if it if it has enough, I was definitely going to be in the mix for this. Yeah, no, I you're you're right on on all of that. But uh, it's I, I I think we. I think we attach a lot to directors and and their history and go, okay, well, you know, this is going to be an awards player because all of their films have been. Um, and then sometimes we have something like Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk. Yep. Um, which we're like, Ang Lee is a two-time Best Director winner. Um, he is total Academy Gold now. And that movie was at the top tier of tons of predictions until it came out and it was a massive disaster i mean that was a massive flop like that i think that made like 12 dollars at the box office like i don't i can't remember a film that just dropped off the night it premiered like just completely vanished from everything and yeah it was it was shocking at it just, the, i mean the box office alone was would be enough to have killed the movie um, but yeah, the movie made one point seven million dollars. So oh God, total on a forty forty million dollar budget, and it's yeah. It, oh my God, it and it's a really 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 awful movie. Yeah, well, so, from what I from what I've heard, this is going to be a bit more commercial. I mean, not only is it Matt Damon and you got other names like Christoph Waltz, uh, Kristen Wiig in it that it's got a rec- recognizable cast, but it's also like. Yeah, it's a satire and it's and it's uh, a little bit sci-fi, but it's also um, it's a little it, it's it's a little more conventional than I think people think. Um, I don't think it's going to be that challenging. I just I'm worried from uh, more of a actually more of a critic standpoint. I just don't know if there's going to be a ton of support for this movie. I mean, but I've underestimated Payne before. After I saw Nebraska, I didn't think he was getting a like a director nomination for that. So I don't. I'm kind of like I've kind of been burned by pain a few times, so I'm, <laughs> I'm a little I'm always a little hesitant to just write off uh, things just off bad buzz from test screenings. I, I'm I don't know about that, but but like I said, if if an Oscar nomination happens for this film, and I'm not sure it will, um, I would be most confident in in Chow, um, just because I think she's kind of owns the movie, so to speak. Yeah, and she's and she's back in my top five as a as a result. But but yeah, I mean it's I. I, I don't know. I'm. I'll, I'll be really, really curious to to see what the response is, <clears throat> and and that will most definitely shape uh, future for uh, predictions for it for sure. Um, I I think this might be a a, a good time to talk about, and we've we've dropped a, a few of these names throughout uh, this podcast, uh, and. That's movies that have already uh, debuted and, and or do so outside of the festival circuit. Because I know we get we get pretty locked in to best picture winners and festivals, and reasonably so, because the last time a best picture winner avoided any festival was The Departed, um, and. I, that was an exceptional case, I think, because that was really about Martin Scorsese getting a director win. Um, so it, it's it's much it's much more difficult now for a film to be able to to go all the way without without that. And. I I, th- I think what we're what we're looking at this year has more potential than 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 normal. Um, obviously, if you look at our predictions, the the number one movie right now is Dunkirk, and that's really coming from its really strong box office and really really good reviews, like best of of Christopher Nolan's career. Um, what, what, before we, I get into other 
movies, what's you you have done cricket number two, I have it at number one just for right now, which is a bit of default. Um what do you think is the a real possibility of something like a summer film being able to win and foregoing a decade of <laughs> history and statistics? Not great. Yeah. Um, not great. I would never bet on it. Um, that it, it would take the right combination. Um, I personally, I don't think Dunkirk has that combination. I think it's number one on our poll because it is the safest for a best picture nomination. I mean, it's completely locked for, for that. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's why people put it at number one. Um, my number one through five, I, I feel comp pretty much equally confident in, in those. Um, but, and, and like I said, I think Dunkirk is locked in. I, I will go, this might be a little bit of a, cause I was, this is not an anti Nolan thing. I was very high. The film's been in my top five all year along with Nolan. I was very high on it going into the reviews. Um, so this is not some sort of like, uh, I like anti, you know, uh, underestimating Christopher Nolan thing. I just, I don't think that I wouldn't be shocked if that film is not like a top four or five best picture film when we get to like phase two, because it's not that audience friendly. It's mostly a silent film that lacks much sentiment at all. Mm -hmm. And it really doesn't have a character crutch for the audience either. And you know, that approach, like it works wonders with critics and cinephiles. It's not nearly as effective with like industry and broader audiences in general. I mean, I, I've just, in my personal experience talking to people about the film, there are a lot of like general audience members that are just very unengaged cause it's just not that emotional. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it, it's the Nolan show at all times. Like he's never not the focus of the film basically. And it, it just doesn't have that kind of saving private Ryan, just raw, like character, emotional catharsis. Like it just doesn't have that. And I don't think that it will lead to the type of passion that people think it will. Now, it'll always look like a top five film because it's going to hit DGA. Nolan's definitely getting his director nomination. It's going to hit editing. So it's going to have all the um, marks of a top five best picture film. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's going to come anywhere near a best picture win. I just I don't think it's going to be in the conversation for that. Um, but I and, and saying that. I mean, it would be pretty weird for Nolan to like end up winning Best Director for a film that's really not, doesn't really have a chance to win Best Picture. But because of the type of film it is, and because Nolan's never won or even been nominated, I think there is there is a path for him winning. But like, if something like Shape of Water hits and and Del Toro delivers, like, I don't think Nolan's going to beat him. Just, I don't think the film is going to be that strong. So. Um, I, I and really that really doesn't have anything to do with like did it premiere at a festival or whatnot, but it it just feels like a type. Of, it almost feels like a film that's going to end up being a filler best picture nomination and not really something that's going to threaten to win. That's just my opinion. I, I I think that's perfectly reasonable, and and you know we just have to look at the this last five ish years of picture and director splits of how those have broken down. And I totally agree. If if the competition were between Dunkirk and Shape of Water, I don't see a split happening there. If it's between, you know, Dunkirk and Call Me by Your Name, that might be where you could do a uh, a split pretty easily. Absolutely. Or Dunkirk and the Papers, that could be a split. Or um, even Dunkirk or Get Out or something like that. Like that could be like it's such a directorial achievement. And like I said, Nolan is always the star of that film that I'm never going to say he, he can't win for it. I just don't think the film itself is going to have the level of passion that the Metacritic score or whatever it does with critics wins. I don't think the audiences respond to it like that. I don't think it's that Saving Private Ryan level of war film. So. Oh, it's most definitely not. No. <laughs> and it. To it, to its credit, there's there's there are certain things about it that that that's a good thing that it's not, you know, just trying to ape that. But uh, yeah, you're you're right that there is really um, there isn't much of an emotional hook to it, and that makes it really difficult. Uh, I think Tom Hardy might actually have more dialogue in his plane talking into his helmet than the de facto lead has. <laughs> Probably. Um, 
and you know you're it just yeah it doesn't it doesn't go far enough to really try and establish much more than situational uh characters rather than you know something that's driving and pushing them right so and and you always talk about like precursors and like is it going to hit sag ensemble probably mm-hmm. not is it going to get a screenplay nomination i don't think so so those are two huge strikes against it winning best picture if it if it doesn't get those i mean you can just if it doesn't get both of those you can almost write it off in my opinion so um i just like you yeah like you said it's just it's i don't think like it looks really strong now because we're in the middle of this it's gonna have great box office and but you got to project like four months down the line is it still gonna have that much passion like four or five months down in like phase two and the winning votes i don't i don't know i don't think so yeah, I mean, I, I I wouldn't totally count out SAG just because its early release, you know, gives it a benefit over any late December movie. So that does help. That does help. It just doesn't feel like an actor's movie to me. No, I don't. It doesn't. So I it, it I I think it's it it has a decent profile if you're looking at you know Mark Rylance, Tom Hardy, and Kenneth Branagh because they're all. Academy nominees or winners, so you there that that bit of draw is is there, but not really. Yeah, I kind of get like bad. I I think I remember the people argued that with The Martian because it was Matt Damon and mm-hmm. Jeff Daniels and you had a bunch of name actors in that, but it wasn't an actor's movie, and so it missed SAG Ensemble. Like it just doesn't. Dunkirk is not a movie that really relies on the actors at any point like they're almost like props it almost feels like a malik film so um <laughs> i don't i i'd be i'd be pretty surprised if it hits sag ensemble but it's, it's possible i guess yeah uh so you mentioned one of the other films that i want to talk about that <clears throat> is outside of the festival scope well mostly mostly um get out uh did debut at sundance but uh, you know, I'm, I was, I, I speak more to the, the core fall festivals really, but this is a movie that absolutely exploded and blew everybody away, uh, both in its, uh, critical response and the box office just is extraordinary. And right now it's at number seven on our best picture list, and I'm I'm really curious because I've seen some uh, high profile uh, awards prognosticators that are not including it, and I can kind of see why, but then. I, I don't see why it would not be able to make it in. It will hit PGA. It has a really good chance of getting a DGA nomination for Jordan Peele. Uh, it's getting Writers Guild. It's 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 going to do a lot of precursor uh, damage, and I'm I'm really looking forward to that. Um, you we both have it at number five. Mm-hmm. It is a top five contender for both of us at the moment. Um, we both also have Jordan Peele at number five for director. So, I mean, at least in terms of this podcast, it's the Mutual Admiration Society podcast because we both <laughs> totally agree. So there's 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 not really uh, uh, someone that's that is providing a counter argument, but we can you know both really also point out things that are not. Uh, Maybe not in its in its favor, but I think those are much smaller than the things that are. Right, and I can I can address those those skeptics out there. Um, <laughs> they, I, I mean, it's a val. I understand the position because of the film it is, because it has horror elements, because it has it's a thriller. I understand the argument that hey, this film can do really well at precursors, which it will. That's a lock. Um, and still not make it in with the Academy. I understand that thrillers have a hard time breaking through the Academy. I understand that you just need to, I really think people don't understand 
the this film's overall profile okay it has an 84 on metacritic which really does not even properly gauge the way critics have been discussing the film post breakout like i'm very confident that when we get to critics awards in december you'll see jordan peele winning major screenplay awards he'll be winning breakthrough awards obviously it will hit the best picture lineup at basically every regional critics i mean it's going to be a big deal uh, with regional critics. Um, it'll go comedy at the Globes, which makes the path to nominations very easy. And Jordan Peele is the exact type of guy who would go to like HFPA parties. And he's the guy type of guy they fall in love with. So I'm, I think it's a lock for a lot of Globe nominations. Um, PGA, like you said, that's a done deal. Mm-hmm. Um, I honestly think it's going to make SAG Ensemble. Like I'm much more confident in it hitting SAG Ensemble than something like Dunkirk. Um, so, you you look at all these its precursor run is going to be strong i feel extremely confident about that so basically you're betting against that the academy is just going to go they're going to see all this success in december and they're just going to go nope it doesn't fit into our little box of what an academy film looks like and i just <laughs> i that just i just you really see this film has weight to it and it has social relevance and it has a huge social footprint in terms of it's still getting referenced. The movie came out in February, and you still see people talking about it on social media all the time. It's quoted all the time. It has a huge imprint on society. And like I said, it has weight to it, which it separates it from like, you know, you, uh, other poor things that have failed in the past. And I don't even really know if you can compare it to anything that's failed in the past. It has a much stronger profile. I don't know what the precedent is for this film for a film like this missing a best picture nomination, it just doesn't have any precedent in general, which Mm -hmm. is a good thing. I think it makes it an an underdog. I think that's why it can not only get a best picture nomination. I think it's why it could be in the conversation for a best picture win at the end of the day. Like, I'm not going to predict that right now, but I think it's going to be one of those films that people just sleep on. And that gives it a rooting interest and an underdog factor that makes people want to vote for it more. So, um, I just I feel very confident in this film's profile. Like I said, we both have a top five. Um, it reminds me. I'm not going to say it's the exact. They're very similar, but the way people talk about the film in terms of passion and consensus, you really don't find that many people who don't like it. The types of people that you think wouldn't like it, some of the older white liberal people that the film actually makes fun of, actually like it the most. Like in my experience, like I've noticed that. <laughs> Those are the people that are actually some of its strongest supporters. Um, It reminds me a lot of the way people talked about Whiplash, to be honest. And that was a film that was a thriller that the Academy embraced once it got over its kind of visibility issues in in phase one. This won't have any visibility issues um, at all because it's an early release. Everyone will have seen it. They might re-release it in the theaters at the end of the year. Um, I just, it reminds, and kind of the leanness and the sharpness of the film reminds me a lot of of whiplash and the passion that it generates. So I just don't, I don't really, I'm very confident in it, uh, in it, it overperforming what people think it's going to do. Yeah. I I completely agree. My grandparents loved it and they're 87 and 95. Yeah. (laughs) So it's got the old white people vote. (laughs) My mother is one of these women who mostly only goes out to see like period films or like English, you know, like, um, you know, like Darkest Hour type stuff. Oh my God. And she went to see Get Out and loved it. And I was like, you went to see Get Out? And she was like, oh, yeah, I loved it. Um, everyone's talking about it. So, I mean, it it hits demos that people don't realize. Like, it does not skew. Like, it's not just a film for young people that I think a lot of, I think that's kind of the kind of perception that it has, but it's not like that at all. So, um, and it, like I said, not only does it have, does it have passion, but it has consensus. Like there really aren't that many people who don't like the film. And you look at these past like thriller films that missed like Gone Girl and Nocturnal Animals. And you say, well, the Academy doesn't like thrillers. Those are polarizing films. There are a lot of people who don't like those movies. And this reminds me more of Whiplash where it was really hard to find someone who didn't like that movie. And that's kind of how I feel about this film. Well, I don't think you can point to a single movie this year, period. And, I'll even say that with movies that haven't come out yet, um, that crosses so many genres uh, because it's a comedy, it's a satire, it's a drama, it's a horror movie, it's a thriller. It is both contemporary and historical. It 
it does absolutely everything and it does it seamlessly and flawlessly and it's the reason why you can have every age group color group anything this is why it has something for everyone and it's there is nothing else that is like that everything else I'm looking, you know, at these lists that, you know, they, they can they can be fit into into pretty easy boxes. And when you're putting together, you know, a list of best picture nominees, you're like, OK, well, here's this type of movie that's going to hit, you know, this target of the Academy. And here's this kind of movie that does really well. And here's another. This this is this does everything for everybody. And it will never now be able to be underestimated that the huge uh, last two years of diversity pushes with uh, Academy invitations uh, have had a real impact. Um, we, we saw that this year and it was it was proof positive. Um, so when when you say something like a get out could be an underdog to win, it absolutely could. It's it's one of the main reasons I think, that Moonlight won because you had La La Land be this de facto winner. Uh, everybody had just basically kind of said, okay, well, it's happening and and, and gave up uh, yep. on, on that. And the voters said no <laughs> and, and turned that on its head. Uh, and they could absolutely do that again this year, especially in a year that is far less diverse than last year there there there's there's going to be voters that are really looking for something outside of you know a, a staid biopic uh like darkest hour or maybe even the papers uh and they're going to be looking for something else and that is the movie they're going to find yeah like i said i get the hesitancy i understand when people are like there's no precedent for a film. For, there's really no precedent for a film like Get Out being a huge Oscar player. But I would then counter with, what's the precedent for a film like this not making it? There's no. Look at the film's profile from a massive box office standpoint. Like it is a huge breakout, uh, populist breakout. It has critics in its corner, and it's a film that has both passion and consensus. Like. That profile, no matter what the film, like whether it's a horror film or a thriller film, that profile is super strong. Like there is not much precedent of a film like that ever missing this picture. So I just I don't I, I think it's a little uh, I don't want to say narrow minded, but it's just it doesn't it's it you got to project out and see like what's going to have passion at the end of the year. And this film has already survived months of. Uh, of since it came out and it still has passion people still talk about it passionately so i don't see why it won't be like that in january that that's what strikes me as so strange about the hesitance is that this is already an established entity uh in in terms of reviews box office and being able to hold the conversation as we are you know almost seven months eight months into its uh, release i I, that that impact is real. Um, I think it's interesting that as a horror thriller released in February, it's kind of aligns it with Silence of the Lambs <laughs> as the last Maybe. time that this happened. And, Maybe. T- and Silence of the Lambs being the only horror thriller to ever win. I'm not making any direct comparisons at all. I'm just saying it's interesting. It is interesting. <laughs> So there's that. Um, I think we have a couple of other movies to possibly talk about that are obviously not quite at the level of Get Out um, in in terms of, you know, pre-festival releases. Um, I think we need to talk about, obviously, Detroit, which just opened to good reviews but very strong backlash and really really bad box office uh detroit was 
a my number one for months as an on paper uh, looks too good to lose kind of uh, film and coming from an Oscar winning director whose last two films did very well at the Academy Awards and you know we've touched on that with Alexander Payne and with Ang Lee you know where you have people with prestige uh, and then they release a movie that just does not make the cut and it's almost a it's a it's a much bigger fall to to come from from such a high place but I think the fall for Catherine Bigelow and Mark Bowl for this was is is a devastating one uh, that is that's non recoverable. Um, it's it's really strange because, like I said, there are some very good reviews, and mostly uh, it is a very well scoring film. Um, but if you look at uh, like the reviews for uh, from Ira Madison or Angelica Jade or maybe any person of color, <laughs> which there are not that many of in film criticism. So uh, please search them out to get a different point of view. Um, I, 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 I can never tell until it's right there if, you know, Twitter controversies and backlashes are a part of a broader scope. Sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. I feel like this was. Um, and it's a weird counter to get out in terms of how it's presenting uh, the plight of violence against black people in America, both historically and contemporary. Um, it is the polar opposite of that. And it's it's why Get Out is a huge success and why Detroit is not. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, it. I'm going to set aside the controversy for a minute because I'm not sure how much that affected. It obviously affected it. Um, but from an awards perspective, uh, here's the. it's in big trouble. Here's Here's why. The deal with these spring and summer releases is you need to fall into one of two categories. You either need to be a big... You need to either be a box office success, like a clear success, or you need to be a movie that critics are going to be reviving at the end of the year in December with Critics Awards. If you don't fall into one of those two categories, you're pretty much screwed. Like, there are very few exceptions. You have a movie like, I think Beasts of the Southern Wild was an exception because that's a that was a tiny film that took all year for people to find and discover. And it had a ton of, it's the type of emotional small film that ended up getting a ton of passion at the end of the year. And that's the type of thing that leads to number one votes. This movie is not like, that. it is not that setup. It has already landed. It has basically hit its peak in terms of exposure. I don't even see it being re-released in theaters at the end of the year. Cause why would they exhibitors? I don't know why they would, if it didn't make any money the first time. Um, it has a lot of, it, it just has a big hurdle uh, in front of it because I don't know how this movie gets back in the conversation at the end of the year. Like it's the reviews are good, not great. 78 on Metacritic. The box office was not good. Um, the controversy is a weight around its ankles. Basically it's like the, the black community doesn't seem to be supporting this film. Um, I understand why Annapurna put it in August, but I think, I think the arguments were that, um, had black films over the recent years like straight out of compton the butler the help they've done really well in august but this is a totally different type of film this is a really tough film um it's a tough watch a lot of people don't like going to the cinema to sit and be miserable for two and a half hours and that's how this movie makes a lot of people feel and the only way you can those types of movies end up being successes are if they are critically adored have tons of acclaim and awards buzz and have you know months of festival hype behind it, and that's why a movie like this needed to play at festivals, and it didn't. Um, that was an interesting decision, to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, I think it showed Annapurna's uh, is still going through some growing pains. With uh, I mean, they're brand new. They're this is their first film, and the marketing and the the rollout of the film. I just 
I don't think it was the best. They're a rookie distributor. I don't trust them to have some flawless awards campaign down the stretch. And like I said before, you either need to be a box office success or a critic's darling. We already have three films this year that check both of those boxes. You have Dunkirk, Get Out, and I would throw in The Big Sick into that mix, which check both both of those boxes. This one doesn't check either. And we're not even at the fall festivals yet. So it's it's in a really bad spot. It's kind of in its land. And um, so, yeah, I don't, I'm very pessimistic on its awards chances at this point. Yeah, it's, I mean, I dropped it from number one to number 10, and it will be out, you know, probably before this podcast is done. <laughs> <laughs> because it's just, uh, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's devastated at this point. And, you know, a lot of people will feel like that is rightfully so because it, it took, it took what I think a lot of people feel is a white gaze version. That's G A Z E, not G A Y S. Um, <laughs> uh, look at this and, uh, and people don't like feeling like they need to be taught a lesson. That's that's not really the best approach. I I sympathized with Bigelow and her, you know, comments that uh, she I mean, she said herself, am I the right person for this? No, but I am a person that can make this. Uh, I, I I get that. But it is also the um, it is the folly of a. Um, let's let's try and use a, a, a good phrase for this, <laughs> of a well-meaning person and a well-intentioned person. Uh, it might have been better for her to be a producer on this and find um, a seasoned or respected uh, black director and writer uh, to do it instead of her and Bull opting for a very kind of academic and uh, journalistic approach because they took the very same approach to this as with Hurt Locker and Zero Dark Thirty, which for those films worked really well. I think it was a grievous error yeah. to, to do that for this film mm -hmm. because in a little bit <clears throat> like Dunkirk, it is completely robbed of emotional content and then becomes purely... Uh, as many have mentioned, torture porn. So it's, it's, yeah, but that's kind of really where that's at. Yeah. For, I, I would also recommend you were mentioning different perspectives, film criticism. I recommend chaos and Collins on the ringer thought he did a nice job. Wesley Morris talked about it on his, uh, New York times podcast, uh, discussed the film at length. I'd seek those out at well as well. If you're looking for like different perspectives on the film. Absolutely. And I, and, you know, I, I hope everybody does that when, when they are, you know, looking for reviews and, and, and ideas and not just, you know, looking for something that's going to back up your own <laughs> opinion or hope for what a movie is going to be. Um, you mentioned the big sick, which is great because that is, um, that is the third movie that I wanted to, to kind of, uh, feature in this, summer release non-festival you know fall festival uh thing great reviews uh really good box office success um good counter programming which is always really important when you know you're stuck in <coughs> summers of sequels and superheroes and stuff like that so i mean I don't see us, n none of us have it as a Best Picture nominee right now. So that's, you know, cards on the table. But uh, Holly Hunter and the screenplay seem like very, very good uh, chances. Yeah, I, I'll just say if I if we had 11 spots for picture instead of 10, I would have it 11th. Um, I don't, I've seen a lot of people drop like just drop it out of like it, their long list of like what could get nominated for best picture. I, I, I would not do that. Um, this absolutely has the kind of profile that could reemerge at the end of the year. Uh, 
when comparing it to something like Detroit, which, I mean, if you just compare the two profiles, this has a much stronger one. I mean, mm-hmm. 86 on Metacritic, that virtually guarantees like a major presence of the critics, regional critics at least. I um, mean, definitely screenplay, definitely Holly Hunter. Um, I could see Kamel hitting some. I could see it getting in a lot of best picture lineups at the regional critics. Um, uh, not to mention, you know, it's going to be comedy at the Globes, so it's got a really good shot at at least one, if not more than one, Globe nomination. Um, so between those two things, right there, you have it'll absolutely be in the conversation in December. Like that virtually guarantees it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's headed for over forty million at the box office, which is definitely good enough. It's not some massive breakout like Get Out, but it's a successful hit. That performed especially well on the coast. It had a great per theater average in LA and New York, which is a good sign. Um, and audiences just like it. Like it's funny, it's emotional. Um, it has a strong audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. I think 91%. Um, it's got potential to get nominations in both acting and the writing branches, which is key. It can get Holly Hunter in, in acting. It can get an original screenplay nomination. It's got a diverse cast, so even something like SAG Ensemble, I think, is absolutely in play. I was just it's, thinking how cool that would be. <laughs> I mean, if, if certain things fall I, or don't land at the fall festivals or down the stretch, it's it has um, and and I and I'll I'll add that Kumail has put in a ton of work in promoting this film ever since Sundance, getting it into the conversation on social media. And I really expect him to continue that effort come awards season and just in terms of general campaigning. Um so I really just don't think people should write it off. It's got a well-rounded profile. And if a few things, you know, if the Fall Fest slate is weak in terms of potential Best Picture nominees, or if a few big hitters down the stretch don't land, which always happens, um, I think there's absolutely a path to it sneaking in like the 789 range in Best Picture. I think it should people should absolutely consider it. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, Lionsgate, which I... <clears throat> well, well, Amazon. It's yeah, Amazon. Lionsgate. Amazon yeah. Lionsgate. Uh, which which has last flag flying, right. uh, so I a- Amazon's got a got a full plate this year. They, they got do. last flag flying. They have this and they have Wonder Wheel and they have Wonderstruck. So that's good. That's going to be very interesting to see how that all plays out. But I just I think this is established a really strong you know it's going to be in the mix. Like Amazon's going to send out screeners. And they're one of the studios that I'm actually very high on because last year they sent out they even sent out like love and friendship screeners to like every guild and i know that didn't get in anywhere but it showed to me that they really pay attention to like what's important in terms of getting these precursor nominations you got to get screeners out and not only will the big sick have screeners out early but most people have already seen the film so visibility won't be an issue at all which is always you know visibility is probably the one thing i would always say that is the most underrated in terms of uh, in terms of what comes out of nowhere with with these awards, so yeah, I, I mean, I I got screeners for everything Amazon last year and right. and early, and they they are very serious about that game, right? So it's yeah, I I don't I don't think that will change this year. They're um they're in they're in the hunt, yeah, uh, for for some real uh, gold. <laughs> And and they should be. I mean, they're they're trying to to disrupt, and and they're doing a really really good job of it. Um, do we have anything else that might? I feel like those are like the the three movies that had the potential. Uh, two of which, you know, have have made it. Um, I I don't see much else coming from the. Uh, the January to August. No, I think those are clearly the three, and and like like we talked about Detroit too, which, um, which is kind of now more on the periphery. But yeah, uh, that, that's what I mean. We two, two of the three, you know, are are definitely in the mix, and and Detroit being on the far outside now. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it looks like I think that's about it. Jeez. Um. What else? Let's see. God, we talked about best actress. We talked about supporting actress. We actually got more covered than I was e- expecting to. Um, is there? Is there... I'd like to. I'd like to bring up uh, talk about Shape of Water. Good. So. Yes, that's good. 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 Because I know we had. Yeah. Okay. Well, in, this is a film <laughs> in the many aborted um, podcasts. Which nobody was nobody really, really knows seriously. about. Um, 
Uh, we, I'll give we you, have been able to, Eric, I gotta to give you credit. You were the first one to put it into so, yes, uh, the gold rush game chart uh, about a month ago. Oh my so god! On that. Oh, that movie I think that's going to end up looking very pressing. Predictions and um, is hitting but every like single festival. Like I said, no, one's ta- no one was taking this film seriously, even after Fox Searchlight data for go. December. All right, so um, go even ahead, after Brian. the trailer, which I, I thought was beautiful. Um, but a lot, you know, a lot of people kicking and screaming, saying this isn't an awards player. It's a genre film by Guillermo del Toro. His last few films have not been anywhere near the awards race. So that's and it's a fantasy genre film about a fish man. So, I mean, very understandable reaction as far as why people are hesitant to even consider this for best picture Uh, from the information that I've we've all gotten over the last month. um, I and just the way Fox Search I feels about it, the the festival run that it now obviously has between Venice, Telluride and TIFF. Uh, I know it's not announced for New York, but do, I would not be surprised if it ends up ends up playing in New York. Um, people need to start taking this film seriously. I, I feel very comfortable saying that uh, as a best picture, as a best picture film, as a film that could end up leading all films and nominations. I mean, you're looking at something that, other than lead actor, it can be a player in literally every category. I mean, makeup, literally every. Every technical category, uh, it's got it's got multiple uh, acting parts that could pop. Um, it's and here's the thing with these genre films that I don't think I think people it's kind of why people underestimate Arrival even after seeing it last year. Yeah. Uh, as long as the film is emotional and audiences respond to it from an emotional standpoint, you can overcome the genre bias and the fantasy bias and whatever else you think is going to hold this movie back. Uh, and from what I've heard, it's a very emotional film. I mean, you can probably tell from the trailer, um, but it is a beautiful film, very artistic. Sally Hawkins' character, she plays a mute woman, is very sympathetic. Um, it has uh, Michael Shannon, who's an Academy darling, chewing scenery. It has Octavia Spencer, who's an Academy darling, uh, being a scene stealer. It has multiple other character actors, Richard Jenkins, who's uh, Michael Stuhlbarg, who's in everything nowadays. Um, It has a great cast. Um, Guillermo del Toro, however you feel about his work or him as a director or his last few films, that guy is beloved in the industry. I'm telling you right now, he's, he's, he's a really nice guy. People love him. The internet is the the internet still loves him. They still want him to do well. Uh, (laughs) The reaction to this trailer, this movie has been very positive and from what I can tell, it's a film that's not only going to get really good reviews, but it's the type of award, uh, audience-friendly movie that could end up winning, like the TIFF Audience Award. I, it would be my pick to win at this point, uh, looking at the the schedule there. So, and it's got Fox Searchlight behind it. It's going to be Fox Searchlight's number one. Um, they really feel strongly about it. It seems like um, it has all the ingredients. Uh, not only to be a strong best picture contender, but if you're looking at something that can win, there really aren't that many things on paper, to me at least, that have the kind of mix that this film has. I mean, it it has a lot going for it, and I just think that people should take it really seriously because if it gets really good reviews at Venice, um, it's in a prime position to kind of establish itself as one of the front runners, in my opinion. Yeah, that's that's a it's a stellar argument, and 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 it's pretty undeniable too <clears throat> um fox searchlight certainly wants to uh score a win after uh how bad last year went for them uh so and and looking at what they do have this year it's it isn't even close that this is their number one this is their number one and and like you said if if it hits this is a movie that should very likely be the nomination leader um, it could it could hit everything except for lead actor at this point. If it did, that would be fifteen, and that would make it an all time historical champ. That that might be a little bit out of reach, but it's still going to most certainly break ten. It will be in. It will it'll be huge. Um, I'm I'm excited for it. I'm really excited for the fact that we are in an era where genre films aren't going to be sidelined the way that they used to be 
Um, I've been Oscar watching for a very long time, and the majority of that time, it was very easy to see what kind of movies were going to do well and win, and and because they were the same kind of movies all the time. And now we have, you know, Moonlight's winning, and <laughs> we can have something like The Shape of Water, which is a human man-fish romance fantasy sci-fi movie. I mean, it's it sounds crazy. But like you said, if there is an emotional hook, that's that is the key to its success. Yes. Uh, and that's what it looks like from from everything that we've seen so far. And you're right, Del Toro is absolutely beloved. Um he has a really broad base uh of fans, not just you know, sci-fi fan geeks on the internet, but he has a really great broad base. And and my my feelings about this film and that it's hitting every festival is is that this could absolutely be the one to beat. And and Del Toro is a as a member of the the Three Amigos. The other two, Alfonso Cuarón and and in Yuritu, they've pretty much dominated this decade of the Oscars. Like, it wouldn't be that shocking if the third one of them ends up having a big Oscar movie to me. I mean, that that's always kind of made sense to me. Um, and I, I've seen a lot of people say, like, well, okay, so it's a directorial achievement, maybe even an, an original concept, maybe a writing achievement. It has technical. Obviously, it's going to get text for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but are the actors going? Like, is it is it an actors movie? It's a it's a fantasy genre movie. Well, yes, and I mean I understand that argument. But I, I was watching the trailer, and it really felt to me uh, gave me a lot of the same vibes that I remember the first time I saw the footage of Birdman, where Lubeski is ve- was very intimate with the actors in these very confined spaces, and it really showed off their performances. And I think that that technique is what del toro is going for with this film i mean if you watch the clips of the film it's very intimate with the actors i've heard things about hawkins performance and shannon's performance that are very positive uh people are very optimistic on their chances that the actors will go for this and also i was kind of looking at films that could get three acting nominations there really aren't usually we get one like manchester last year Mm -hmm. there's usually one at least that gets three this is to me this is the movie that can do it i mean i i maybe call me by your name but that would need to get two supporting actor nominations which is really tough to pull off maybe something like roman israel if carmen ajogo's part's good enough other than that it's that's pretty much it unless the papers has some great supporting part that we don't know about this is the movie that can do it it can get a sag ensemble nomination in my opinion the cast is 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 a bunch of people at the height of their careers um and so i just think it has all the ingredients i I don't really if it gets great reviews at venice which i'm feel pretty good about it doing uh i don't see any reason like it has all the ingredients to me. i don't see any flaws in its profile and it's going to have months and months of festival hype to build up to that box office so um i think i don't i don't really I think it has it has a really good shot to establish itself at this point. Very much so. Um, I, I, it, I, I, I do think it needs to get that tag ensemble. Um, historically, it needs it. Yep. Um, I don't see it as a, 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 an issue, though, whatsoever. <clears throat> Fox Searchlight's really good with screeners. Um, this is a cast, like you uh, already mentioned, that is full of... Uh, like Oscar winners and nominees and character actors who are all and have been the core of the Screen Actors Guild. Um, I don't see, I don't see how it would not be able to get that. It, it's, it feels like a, like a no brainer there. Um, I, I am only slightly curious slash hesitant, but not very much. Um, in that the crew of the film, with the exception of of Desplat in score, <clears throat> are all and they're non nominees. Uh, they they don't have very much awards presence, um, so they would all be 
first timers, uh, like, you know, costume design, projection design, editing, cinematography, all of that. Um, and not that that's impossible, obviously. Uh, the Moonlight hit its ceiling of nominations in technical categories uh, with newcomers. So it's, it's far from uh, the scope of, of, you know, not happening. So it's, um, I, but I am, I am curious about that. Yeah. Uh, I will bit. say that we're coming off a year where a lot of people, a lot of newcomers got nominated in the technical categories, like a lot uh, more than people expected. And if you also look at the makeup of the guys that are in the people that are in contention for the, the like cinematography and some of these tech categories this year, it's a lot of like big names, established names. Mm -hmm. So usually like you usually don't get like five, you know, Roger Deakins, Bruno Delbanel's nominated in cinematography. There's usually at least one or two new <coughs> so editing is not that reliant on names. Uh, production design is more reliant on the strength of the picture. I mean, I just had to look at this trailer. I know it's getting nominated for production design. That's mm -hmm. going to happen. Um, costumes, yeah, it's a no name. But again, that will probably be dependent on the strength of the film. Could miss there. I don't know. Um, Desplat, um, in a film like this, I think he has the potential to win again. I mean, it is the type of film that lends itself to a very showy score. Um, so I think that he's in a very good position to get nominated. Um, so yeah, I understand that, that hesitancy, but like I said, we're coming off a year where a lot of newbies got nominated in the text. I'm, it, there's going to be a movie basically every year where that, where that happens, where it's just the movie's so strong that it really, the, the names behind it don't really matter that much. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, that, that can happen a little more within the individual guilds because they can be pretty protective of their own. <laughs> And sometimes it's a little more difficult to break into, but uh, it's it's kind of almost easier, I think, with, within the Academy. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I only brought that up just as a tiny little bit of devil's advocate. Um, but it's it's not really against the film at all, because like you said, we, we are going to see that every year, uh, and I think more and more. And again, that's, you know, you... You, you can lend the the increased invitations of the last two years to the Academy to uh, the opening up of nominations like this for first timers um, and and just the the, the doors being uh, much more open than they than they used to be uh, for sure do you have any do you have any hesitancy with the December release date? In terms of like being a be potential best picture winner, so a little bit, yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's while not a a direct comparison to La La Land because it's not the same. Um, it has the same limited release date. It's hitting the exact same festivals. Uh, there are some similarities in in that for sure. Um, we're we're still. Uh, also in an era of not having a December release win Best Picture since Million Dollar Baby. That's still intact. Um, just as intact as the, the SAG Ensemble uh, statistic of, of needing that nomination to win. Um, which, which I think was, you know, one more, you know, reason why La La Land did not win. So I, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit hesitant, but <clears throat> at this point, you know, I'm, we are really more looking at, at nominations, but it, it's, it's impossible not to look throughout the year at what a potential winner uh, is going to be and everything that's going to, to, to build to that. So it's, I'm, I am a little hesitant about the December release, but it's not like it's going to be unseen. Right. I, I it's under it, that's understandable. I I don't care at all because I think the December release had zero correlation to why La La Land didn't win. Like I just it was it established itself earlier than Moonlight, uh, premiere wise, trailer wise, everything. It was it was the front runner from the beginning. So the reason why I think the December stat 
has held up over the years is because things like the Revenant or the Big Short or these late breakers that come along, they premiere too late and they don't have time to build and establish themselves and go through the phase of of being the front runner and then not and then coming back. And it's they they're just late premieres have a hard time pulling it off. And this is not going to be a late premiere. This will premiere at Venice. Um, it's going to be seen uh, for months. It's going to have months of festival hype. So whether if, if it was dated for Thanksgiving weekend, two weeks earlier than December 8th, it doesn't matter to me. I think they'll have zero effect on whether it ultimately wins Best Picture or not. Well, I, I mean, it is actually a really good release date because there's not a lot around it. Uh, Thanksgiving right. weekend is already really packed. Mm-hmm. Um so and I, I think Fox Searchlight saw what La La Land did last year in that week, in that spot. It was a monster uh, uh, on, in L.A. and New York. It was a huge box office success overall. And I think that they think they have that type of potential juggernaut where if it has that kind of festival hype behind it, you give it more and more time to build the word of mouth because it is such a kind of a weird movie that they, it needs time. It needs as much time as possible for people to be like, you have to see this movie. It's amazing. And, and it's going to be a huge awards player and stuff like that. So I understand the release date. Um, and I think from a box office perspective, it's actually smart. Yeah, it's 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 going to be good too because that, that it will open just before uh, the Screen Actors Guild and uh, Golden Globe nominations. So that's I think that benefits it too. I think once those nominations come out, that will and you know and it does well there. That will give it a really big uh, second weekend. Yeah, it's a good point. So it's that that seems that seems logical to me. So yeah, I mean it's. I'm only trying to poke holes in things so that, you know, I don't. Yeah. So we don't come off as too high on, I understand. So I don't burn myself too much. Yeah. On it. <laughs> Cause you know, it's just, it, it seems like, it seems like a, a great, a great time for a movie like this. Uh, we're, we're, we're in a time where genres do not matter as much as they used to. Uh, and f- history was made this year with moonlight there's no reason it can't be done again with this and and years moving forward so it's i it's one more thing that makes me feel great about the chances for a movie like this and for something you know outside of traditional biopics and and things to be able to to win i mean i'm sure the papers is going to do really well and be respected and it's going to be very topical but there's no way in hell that i'm going to predict an unseen movie coming out on december 22nd i don't care if it's steven spielberg (laughs) (laughs) it's just not going to happen yeah um well going back to the thing about late premieres uh the papers is going to be a super late premiere like under the wire thanksgiving weekend probably um and it's just really tough to bet on those, even though this project was like made for the Oscars. It's, I mean, literally, I mean, I think they rushed it out because of the political climate and it's just very timely. Um, and it almost feels predestined. Like I, I almost too big to fail. I don't know what kind of reviews it would have to get not to make best picture, to be honest. Um, but at the same time, it also feels too obvious as a best picture winner, like something like that. Uh, I don't know if it will have the, end up having the passion in phase two to actually win. Um, so when I'm looking at like, you know, potential best picture winners for me personally, uh, I'm looking at shape of water. I'm looking at get out and I'm looking at call me by your name. Those are really the three that stand out to me just in terms of like projecting four or five months down the line. I could see those having both passion and consensus and all three of those would be super weird, like just on paper in terms of best picture winners. Um, but at the same time, they, it also makes sense to me because I think what you're gonna see, especially with this new voting membership, and we saw it last year with Moonlight, is things that don't fit into the pre-programmed, like, oh, this is Oscar bait, and so this is what's gonna win. I, I see more and more things 
ending up being winners that are things that you would never like i remember most of last year people being like doubting whether moonlight would even get a best picture nomination we had that discussion on multiple podcasts and we knew it was going to get great reviews and all this stuff and we were still like mm-hmm. eh, are they really going to go for a gay black film and take place in miami that has no stars it's not going to make any money it's like nah <laughs> I, but and it won best picture so i think people need to open their mind like open up their uh like with their preconceived notions of what a best picture movie is nowadays I think it's going to be open to a lot more possibilities. And so some one of those films winning actually, uh, to be honest, makes a lot of sense to me. I know. And I think we might be actually getting close to getting to retire a phrase like Oscar bait. We, uh, hopefully. We would might be, really be getting there. <laughs> that would be great. Which would be really awesome. Uh, w- one thing I did just think about the papers, though, that that might you know help it out a bit is that uh this time last year hidden figures was kind of also in a similar boat where it was uh, a late start it wasn't even finished until november um i saw like a 20 minute clip of it in in october and they were still that was 20th century fox as well and they were still able to get screeners to uh like screen actors guild on time and it won um so it's I, I think there's potential there for 20th Century Fox to 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 do well with with the papers, but still. Yeah, I actually yeah, and the cast, uh, especially like not just Hanks and Street, but the supporting cast is littered with like SAG bait, basically. Um just in terms of all these character actors from television and um so that was i think that was a smart move in terms of casting gives the the project a lot more like excitement about it to see all these people that people like like carrie coon and and all these people in the movie um but again (coughs) hidden figures had really great timing i'm sure this film will have really great timing it's really that and pta's film are really the two late breakers that i feel like are going to be the ones that are talked about and probably suck up all the attention at the end of the year Mm -hmm. um but betting on these these late breakers winning and winning best picture especially something that is as obvious on paper as this movie is um doesn't make sense to me anymore like that that just that it has a path for sure i'm not ruling it out but i i would act i would be pretty surprised if it ends up going all the way and, and being our best picture winner yeah i i i don't i'm with you on that in, in completely <laughs> Um, I do want to close today with uh, the the news that the Motion Picture Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, did vote last night for a new president, and it was a bit of a surprise for most people. It was uh, cinematographer John Bailey, and I know a lot of people uh, thought Laura Dern had a very good chance and was front runner. Um, but she actually declined the nomination, uh, and she stated the reason being that she just is working too much and would not be able to devote the time to the agendas of Ampus that would be necessary. And she threw her support behind uh, Dave Rubin, who ended up not winning, obviously. And it's curious about John Bailey. He has, you know, a certain amount of history and respect within the Academy uh, as the governor of the cinematography branch for 14 years, Um, but he's never been Oscar nominated. So we have a non-nominee heading (laughs) the group (laughs) (laughs) uh, that runs the Academy Awards. So there's a little bit of of irony there. Yeah, it sounds like he's pretty much like a champion for the below the line uh, members, um, which makes sense. There are a lot of them. I'm sure he had a lot of support there. Um, and he just seems like a kind of a, a guy who a lifer who kind of has a lot of relationships with uh, Academy members. And um, I, I, I like it's, the thing about Laura Dern is it was just reported that she she pulled her name out last night. It sounded like that she kind of lost. But I guess it makes sense that now because her her film career has been uh, really strong recently that she's not going to have the time because it really is a. A full-time job basically being mm-hmm. an academy president so it that makes sense to me yeah it's um I, I know a lot of people that you know even if you follow the oscars you know just 
on a on a fringe level the the name of the academy president probably doesn't mean much to people uh or there's certainly not much visibility uh but that changed quite a bit with the the outgoing president cheryl boone isaacs uh, she was very visible um she was integral to the last two years of increased uh, academy invites which uh, is a part of the diversity pledge that they are doing to increase numbers of women and and uh non-white voting members um so i I, I think there might be, you know, a teeny amount of, oh, great, it's an old white guy <laughs> uh, thing. And that's understandable. Uh, Isaacs was only the third woman ever and the first person of color ever to mm -hmm. be president. Uh, and, you know, under her tenure, Moonlight won Best Picture and the diversity pledge happened. So she has an incredible legacy to uh, uh, leave her succeeder. So he has, he has a, his work cut out for him really. Yeah. The one thing you could say about her tenure is she definitely left a legacy. This, this voting membership change is going to have impacts ramifications for a long time. I feel like so um, that's a positive, I think. Oh, so. it's uh, very much positive. So he's, that's, you know, that's going to be his part of his core agenda is continuing that, uh, which is supposed to go through 2020, but you know, I don't see why you would put a deadline on something <laughs> if it hasn't <laughs> happened. So, you know, just keep doing it until it, it happens. Um, and then there's the Academy museum that they're putting together, which I'm sure will be like $800 billion. <laughs> yeah, and everybody sure. will be like, why do we need this? But there we go. So I think that's where we will close for today. It's, um, I think we're both going to be really anxious to get the uh, first reviews in uh, from Venice and, and Telluride uh, of some of these major players, uh, especially the ones that we have a lot of questions about, like downsizing and and, and see where, where we can go with those. And because of the dates of the festivals, I think I'm going to hold the official September predictions off just a little bit so that we can get some of those in, because I know a lot of our predictions are gonna be really hinging on uh, the response to, to these films. So if you don't see the official September predictions during the first week, that's why. But I think what I'll do is kind of keep updating people as we update our uh, predictions live and just kind of see where the the, the trends are, are moving. Um, but, uh, Brian, thank you so much for, for joining me today. Uh, I think we have finally officially gotten this podcast locked in. Uh, finally, third, third try for the listeners out there. We've, my we've God. time. So yes, not even to mention everything from just today. My good. My so just... much, good, so much good audio has been lost <laughs> for, for the archives. I'll, I'll save those for the archives. Um, but yes, uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at awards underscore watch and on Instagram and like us on Facebook. Visit awardswatch.com. Our predictions are updated uh, live. So any changes that we're making, and I know that we've even made some changes during this podcast. Uh, Eric has. I have not. I have. Clarifying. I have. Um, go and check them out because that's that's what we kind of work with uh during the month before we do make our official you know in ink predictions but yeah thank you everyone for listening thank you again brian and yeah no problem goodbye